So I think we we have a good group online. We have all our speakers present, and it looks like it is time for us to get started. So um, I'd like to say hello to everyone out in the audience. My name is Abby Bauer, and I'm an associate editor for Hordes Dairyman Magazine. I want to thank you all for joining us for today's webinar, which is titled A Feed and Forage Outlook. And um, while this year's harvest season has been much less muddy than last year's was for many parts of the country, weather still had an impact, and straight line winds, hail, September snow in different regions of the country certainly have left their mark on feed and forage inventory. So, Today's speakers will talk about that, um, cover what's going on with the harvest season, feed quality, and then exports and byproduct opportunities for our dairy producers. So we look forward to that. We also want to thank Kuhn, who is our sponsor for today's program. Um, we thank them for their support and helping us provide this educational opportunity to all of our listeners. And we have a duo of speakers for today. One of them is also my co-host, Mike Cutchins with the University of Illinois. Originally from Wisconsin, Mike graduated from the University of Wisconsin-Madison before working for the University of Minnesota Extension. From there, he headed slightly south to Illinois, where he has been working at the university since 1979. He travels extensively, pre-COVID obviously, um, talking to audiences about dairy cattle nutrition. Our second speaker is Mike Rankin, the managing editor of Hay and Forage Grower magazine. Mike earned his master's degree from Iowa State University. After spending some time working on a dairy farm in southern Illinois, he joined the University of Wisconsin Extension as a crops and soil agent in Fond du Lac County. After serving the agricultural community there for 27 years, he joined our team here to become the managing editor of Hay and Forage Grower magazine, which is produced in our office here in Fort Atkinson. Other members of our team today are our webinar producer, Jim Balt at the University of Illinois, and our Horde Steerman online media manager, Patty Hurchin. Um, and once again, this webinar is sponsored by Kuhn, and we thank them for their support. Uh, if you are listening to the live presentation, you do have access to all of the slides that are in today's presentation. If you go to the go to control, go to webinar control panel and click on handout, you can get a PDF copy of those slides and you can save that or print it out for later reference. And that might be especially helpful, especially um, later when Hutchins is presenting because um, there's a lot of numbers on some of those slides. So you might want that for future reference. Also, if you have any questions as the presentations go on, please type them into the questions section of the GoToWebinar control panel, and we will answer those at the end of the presentation. Um, and if you have any other questions or comments throughout, you can also communicate with us through that panel. So Mike and Mike, I'd like to welcome you both to the webinar today, and we look forward to hearing your presentation. All right, thank you, Abby. Let's look at this growing season, uh, and here's the, uh, the map of precipitation. Uh, June through August uh, 2020, basically the, uh, the bulk of the growing season. And boy, you know, as you look at this map, uh, I mean, it looks like a smorgasbord at Golden Corral or something. I mean, there is something for everybody on here from uh, record driest to record wettest. Um, you know, as we look uh, over here in the West, of course, a lot of this region is dry anyway, and a lot of it's uh, irrigated, but we did have areas uh, that typically would get moisture. I mean, when we look out here at Western Iowa, um, Eastern Nebraska, uh, this was very dry out here in Western Nebraska. I traveled out there a little bit this summer and uh, boy, if you didn't have irrigation, that corn was just uh, nothing but uh, burnt up stock. Uh, but what's really interesting is, uh, you know, we look out here in New England and they had a really dry year. Uh, in some cases, the driest ever, um, and that's usually not an area that we see, you know, extended drought. Uh, also, through the Midwest, there were there were areas of of pretty significant drought, or at least dry weather. Um, and then you get down here into the middle part of the 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 country um, in the east, uh, and uh, it was actually pretty wet. So. Um, a lot of different scenarios going on here. I, I also want to mention 
that these wildfires out here had a, a tremendous impact on on hay production just from the standpoint of getting hay dry enough um, to get it to get it get it baled. So uh, again, depending upon where you live, um, it's hard to really put a uh, a single mark on this growing season, and there's a lot of variability, and we'll see that as we move forward. Uh, this is uh, USDA's survey on corn planting, and I uh, wanted to look at the end of May here, uh, and you can see that on May tw or May 31st, you know, we basically had this corn crop planted, um, and in fact, by the middle of May, uh, this corn crop was pretty much planted. Uh, as opposed to last year, by the end of May, um, just over half uh, planted. Uh, and my years in extension, <clears throat> uh, one of the things I learned was that, you know, when you have an early planting year, it doesn't guarantee you a great year, uh, but it increases your odds tremendously. Uh, conversely, if you have a, a year where planting is late, um, it doesn't guarantee a poor year, uh, but the best year you can probably have is nothing more than average. Um, so, you know, when you get planted uh, has a big impact on what kind of year it's going to be. And uh, this year uh, we were in good shape from, from that perspective. We always take a look at the drought monitor and, and um, I, I pick the end of July or first part of August um, just to contrast the two years, last year to this year. And, uh, you know, last year was a, a wet year uh, almost everywhere, um, whereas this year, um, significantly more dry weather. Uh, in, and, you know, this is probably about the time in the Midwest right after uh, corn is tasseled, so pretty critical time. Uh, so depending upon where you are, uh, that could certainly have had an impact uh, on uh, whether you have a good corn year or a bad corn year, I guess. Um, and, you know, Mike and I are sitting here in Wisconsin and, and Illinois, uh, and for the most part, uh, a really good growing seasons in, in, in both of those states, but uh, with the understanding that it wasn't like that uh, everywhere. Well, let's take a look. Uh, I always, uh, each year, bring up this hay stocks number. Uh, so this is the amount of hay that we had going into the growing season. And if you'll remember last year, uh, we had one of the lowest uh, hay stocks uh, as of May 1st that we've had in uh, quite a number of years. Um, this year, it bounced back a little. So from... Uh, from the standpoint of having a little extra inventory, um, this year certainly uh, much more appealing uh, than the situation we were in last year. Uh, having said that, um, you know we're also in a situation where we we both don't make as much hay or feed as much hay through the winter uh, as as we once did. A couple of weeks ago, uh, I wanted to do a survey of our uh, readers of eHay Weekly, which is an electronic newsletter we send out every week, uh, to kind of get a, a national perspective on uh, uh, what forage inventories look like. And uh, so I was going to go through those, uh, those answers we got real quick. And uh, what we see here uh, is that 38% uh, excellent. Um, they're going to have carryover going into next season, they feel. 14% um, good, uh, enough for winter, spring, and possibly some uh, carryover. 24% um, had adequate to get through next spring. 16% um, said fair inventory, probably need to purchase some additional uh, inventory. Uh, and 8% at poor that they would need to purchase inventory and make some major uh, ration changes. So as you look at these numbers, um, I guess what you could say is, is that at least three quarters of the respondents thought they had adequate uh, or better uh, inventory in terms of 
what's in their uh, their bunkers or uh, haystacks. Um, the next week we asked them about forage quality. Uh, same kind of thing. Mike, are you are you moving this forward, uh, I, or, or am I? Because this is uh, just changing as we go here. Um, and looking at forage quality, 28% uh, thought they had much better than last year. 42% uh, somewhat better than last year. 18% uh, about the same. 7% uh, somewhat worse and 5% much worse. So again, um, you know, in terms of forage quality overall uh, in really good shape this year. Um, and I think, um, you know, better numbers than what you saw with the inventory. But if you were in one of those dry spots, your yields were down probably, uh, but um, not your forage quality. All right, this is, uh, let's look at prices a little bit. So this is US August average alfalfa hay price. And um, this is uh, figured out by USDA uh, and this year in August, we sat at $172 a ton. This is all qualities of hay, uh, not just really good or really bad, um, all quality. So it's more like an index is the way I look at it. Um, and that was a little bit less than what we saw last August. Um, and actually the last three years haven't been significantly different, um, uh, especially, uh, and all three have been much higher than what we saw uh, in 17 and 16. Um, so that's kind of uh, the August uh, situation. Now, if we look at what kind of delivered prices we're seeing for the premium and supreme quality hay out in California right now, it's about 260 to 295 that's delivered in here in the Midwest. Uh, 215 to 275 delivered in. And we're going to drill down a little bit more on this higher quality hay. Um, wait for a second here. Let's get the first, let's take a look at the uh, average monthly alfalfa hay price. So, what we have here is USDA's average hay price for. 2019 in the red bars, 220 in the blue bars. And I can tell you that uh, September just came in at uh, 171 uh, for this year. Um, so a couple things uh, that kind of stick out. First of all, this year, uh, these prices have been running somewhat less than what we saw in 2019. Um, but the other thing that's uh, kind of interesting is that Hay prices have not changed dramatically for quite some time. So if you look at these hay prices in the range of say 170 to 180 a ton, um, you know, you've got to go back all the way to July of last year uh, when it was 183 to really say that it was significantly out of that 170 to 180 range. We, you know, we didn't have that as high a, of a, uh, of, uh, April, May bump as we often do. Those are usually the two months where um, you have your highest hay prices of the year. Um, but hay prices have been remarkably stable um, for uh, well over a year uh, in, in kind of that 170 uh, to 180 range. So let's take a, look, a little closer look at supreme and premium quality hay. This is, uh, this is something relatively new. USDA started tracking uh, back in January of last year. And the reason they started tracking it uh, is that this is now the number that's used in the uh, dairy margin coverage program, um, the uh, dairy program. And um, so this, this helped uh, pretty dramatically. First, let's take a look at... Um, the average price, and you can see from January of last year uh, to now, uh, that average price has uh, come down actually pretty significantly, uh, at least in terms of the highest uh, top quality hay. Uh, and this average, what they do is they take uh, the top 10 states, 
and then figure this average from the top five dairy states. Um, and uh, a couple months ago, uh, Scott Brown at the University of Missouri did a, uh, a study and uh, looked at, since they started using this approach to that uh, dairy margin coverage uh, program, that uh, this has put about $75 million into dairy producers' pockets uh, when you compare it to if they would only use that uh, average price for alfalfa. So this, this one change alone in, in looking and in terms of what number they use uh, to figure out those feed costs um, has made uh, quite an economic uh, difference as you, might, uh, as you might expect. And uh, if we look here at this next slide, and I'll move it forward. So this is um, California, New York, and Wisconsin. Um, and these are the premium and supreme prices for these three states. What I want you to notice here is let's take a first look at California. Now, California has a relatively uh, reasonable trend line here down, uh, you know, over a period of time, a little bump here in the winter months, as you might expect. But then when you look at Wisconsin in the red and New York in the, the blue, um, you see these months where you have these, these huge jumps or these huge declines. And I, I, think it's, I think it's a matter of there not being as much accessible data to gather by USDA, whereas California has a, a, a fairly uh, uh, intense system, an easy system to get get numbers for hay prices. This isn't like corn, where all you do is look at the the, the board of trade or uh, local markets. I mean, those that doesn't exist for hay. Um, so I, I think there's still some work to be done with this whole system. Um, I just can't believe that you have that much change from one month to the next, uh, and these numbers bounce around in some of these states, but they do have a pretty significant impact uh, in terms of what that final average might be. So uh, kind of interesting to watch those over time. Uh, harvested hay and haylage acres in um, these states. Uh, now, USDA data uh, that we get for, let's say, alfalfa, what you normally would see reported is just alfalfa dry hay because all of the states track that. Um, not all of the states track alfalfa haylage. Um, in fact, there's only 17 that do, and they're listed over there on the right side of the slide. Um, so to really make valid comparisons of alfalfa acres, um, you, really, you really need to throw in alfalfa haylage, especially in states where haylage is a big deal, and in fact is maybe a bigger deal than dry hay is. So what I've done here is they, they started tracking haylage back in 2005. Uh, I'm just looking at numbers from these states for alfalfa hay, uh, haylage, and corn silage just to give us a sense of kind of where the, the forage industry is going uh, and what changes occurred. And so if we look at alfalfa hay from 2005 to 2019, those acres in these 17 states, and there's some big ones here, um, has declined by 33%. Uh, I don't think that's a surprise to anyone, um, especially in the Midwest and East, where haylage uh, has certainly become the uh, more common form of alfalfa harvest. Um, but out West, uh, alfalfa hay is still a very, very big deal. Um, now, if we look at the haylage down here in the green, the acres of haylage um, since 2005, they too are down somewhat, uh, 18%, not as much as dry hay. Um, but then we look at corn silage in these 17 states, uh, and those acres are up about 14%. So probably this, most of this decline in haylage 
uh, is getting taken up uh, by this slight increase or this 14% increase uh, in, in corn silage. Uh, so this is the first time I've ever actually broke these states out. And, you know, you can, you can look at the whole United States, but, but that, that really is, um, misleading, uh, because some states are tracking haylage, some aren't, um, and that sort of thing. So, uh, kind of an interesting slide to see where we've been at. Uh, just to give you an example of one state that has really dropped uh, their alfalfa hay acres, California. You can see California as recently as 2009 uh, had a million acres of alfalfa hay. Um, and this year they are forecasted to be somewhere down around 350,000 uh, um, acres. So. Um, really dramatic decline out west in, in terms of California. And a lot of these acres are getting taken up by um, nut trees, almonds. Uh, if you look at the almond graph, if it was on here, it would be going the exact same uh, opposite direction. All right, let's uh, take a look at the big picture here. Um, excess to adequate inventory exists, I think, on most farms. Um, the exception being non-irrigated western and eastern regions impacted by uh, long-term drought. I had a conversation with a uh, dairy producer. Uh, they milked well over a thousand cows. They were located uh, right on Lake Champlain in uh, Vermont uh, in that New England uh, droughty area this year. Um, and he told me that over the scale corn silage yields for them this year as fed in other words wet uh, 11 ton per acre um, and that uh, is probably about a 50 percent uh, drop in what they typically would get so um, there are uh, situations out there where inventory uh, is a big big issue uh, but overall uh, it looks like inventory uh, should be fine. And, you know, he said, you know, we've got some left over from last year. We took an extra alfalfa cutting. Um, so I think we'll, we'll be okay. But, um, you know, they're, uh, next year, they're going to have to have a good growing season. Uh, forage quality appears to be as good or better than uh, last year on most farms, uh, really throughout the country. Uh, corn silage planting, we talked about this, that uh, certainly more favorable this year than last year, both on the planting and harvest season. Uh, this year, USDA forecasts fewer uh, alfalfa and alfalfa grass production uh, acres, uh, down about 6%. So we'll have to keep an eye and, and see if that comes to fruition. We won't know the official numbers uh, until January. and. Um, after I didn't talk at all about exports, I'll just mention that this year, uh, alfalfa hay exports, which are a big deal out in the West, uh, are up uh, about uh, now currently, they were up almost 20%. Now they're up about 6% uh, this year compared to last year. Uh, China's back in the game with the, the whole tariff deal. Uh, and this does help to bolster hay prices out West. Few things that uh, we're hearing: uh, forage seed inventories look pretty good for most species this year, as is always the case. Top hybrids and varieties uh, are going to be in the shortest supply. Um, and when we talk about species, um, that uh, that range or that uh, can be a lot of things, uh, and it's getting to be more so that way. Um, a lot of uh, producers, dairy producers, uh, other types of livestock producers uh, really starting to get into some of these uh, winter and summer annual forages as a thing that they do every year, not just in these emergency forage type years. Um, there's a lot of uh, opportunity there, a lot of different mixes that can be planted. Uh, so your forage quality, because it's pretty... Uh, uh, a heterogeneous uh, thing uh, can vary, so be sure to test the, those kinds of forages. Um, 
I think we're gonna see some stronger grain prices. Um, that may push some dairies to higher forage rations. I'm sure Michael uh, maybe touch on that here in a second. And uh, finally, these are uh, hay prices that uh, we deliver every week through uh, eHay Weekly, just to give you a sense. And you can look at that on your handout as to where they are just uh, most recently uh, from these various states. Uh, and I think, you know, we can probably say that uh, these hay prices are either about the same or maybe in some cases slightly higher uh, than what we saw uh, last year. Uh, same data given a little bit differently here for premium and supreme quality hay. You can see in some cases uh, a lot of variation depending upon bale type and what part of the state we're talking about. But um, that's uh, that's kind of where things are sitting right now. So with that, I think that's my, um, I think that's my last slide, Mike, and I'll uh, turn it over to you. Well, very good, Mike. Uh, that's a great overview. Thank you for all your, your knowledge and all your, your data as far as that goes. The second part of the uh, webinar, we'll look at what I call the three Qs. Uh, quality, which we've heard about already, quantity, and then, of course, questions that are somewhat interesting. A little bit late for this year, but considering for next year as well. Again, we have a poll question, so we're going to open up, and Jim has got the poll question opened up right now. So we got lots of listeners. Go ahead and vote. We're only going to give you about 20 seconds to vote here because uh, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, we're all done with the politics now, so you don't have to think this one through. You have a three cho uh, five choices. A corn silage quality is above. Now, we're interested in your area. Uh, we saw Mike's data here. Corn silage quality is below average. Uh, it's one of those two boxes. If you got legume grass, you could check either the top box, or the third box, the quality is above average or quality is below average. And of course, if you just want to not really do much thinking at all, you say they're about the same as last year. So that's a, the fifth choice. We could probably have Jim on another four or five choices, but here we're at. So we're off and running here. We got about 60% of the vote in. So you are going to have to vote early here. You, uh, We just got done voting here about a week ago. Go ahead, Jim, let's show the people what our listeners are telling us. And we also had a, an input that came in from uh, Mike as well. So are we going to show that or? Uh, there it is. Thank you, sir. Uh, you can see uh, two thirds of you said qu corn silage quality. And that's about 60% of our listeners online today. Uh, above average, uh, below average, 20% below. And I think that probably reflects some of Mike's comments on drought as far as that goes. Uh, you can see 45% set up in uh, legume uh, grass quality, 11% down. And then 15% of you just said, well, let's just say they're about the same as last year. So that pretty much uh, gives you a bit of a feel from our listeners. And then you also had Mike's data and now you can melt those together. Our thanks to Darylin Labs. Uh, two labs gave me some really neat data this year. Darylin Labs is one of them. They looked at uh, corn silage crop in 2020, 20, 35,000 samples through that lab here. They broke it out looking at uh, uh, basically a three year average and then uh, 2020. And as Abby warned you, you're gonna have to look quickly. We're not gonna read all these numbers to you. Uh, to me, the big numbers that jump out at me at least, you come down here to uh, N N NDF uh, digestibility and you can see a nice increase. That means we should have more energy, more digestibility coming from my uh, corn silage crop this year. And of course, the reciprocal means UNDF, undigestible NDF 240, that number is down, which means these cows should be able to eat a little bit more of this feed. There should be less of a fill factor as well. The other numbers, Mike, I don't see much change in here and you can take a look at those and make your decisions as well. We then uh, went in and one thing they did this year for me from Dairyland, they broke out BMR corn silage, at least identified by those people sending it in. And no big surprises here, but certainly shows why some of my dairy farmers want BMR corn silage and other lower lignin contained forages. Again, you can see in 2020, uh, look at NDF digestibility at, at the 30 hour number down here. You can see that we got about six points higher with BMR, bingo. That's exactly what is supposed to happen. And then of course the UNDF is lower, which means we should be able to put a little bit more of this feed into the ration. And I think that's what our nutritionists are now looking at. Uh, what's common uh, that, that people comment to me about about is that probably a little bit lower in starch and that's exactly what this data would show. We're down uh, about three percentage points in starch 
and uh, it's a little bit wetter too. And, and that's another thing we hear as well. And again, you can see some nice progress in the 2020 year, looking at those NDF values here compared to say the, uh, the three year average. So it appears we do have good corn silage this year. Again, uh, here are the bell-shaped curves. For you scientists out there, you want to see what's the distribution. There it is. Again, uh, thanks to Neil and the group at uh, Dairyland for, for presenting this to me. And you can see on the NDF 30 and down there in, in the middle down here, you can see where that bell-shaped curve has really shifted uh, from the three-year average to the right. And so this uh, today, you want to be on the right. Uh, part of, of the curve here. And if you look at NDF, UNDF 240, it shifts the other direction. And that's exactly what we'd expect to see. And you can study these, print these on out. You can study them to kind of get an idea what percent of the samples fit in there. It's a nice look as well. Uh, Darlene also sent me uh, some uh, uh, starch digestibilities, and you can see they went to the same timeline here, September, October in uh, 2020, and you can see summer's around 70% of the starch should be available in the rumen, and of course, we all know that as this goes into extended storage periods, times for three to four months, this number will go on up. Maybe some of those really high numbers uh, reflect some that's uh, some other reason has been fermented a bit longer, but you can see a, a range there. So to me, it's a useful test, especially when you look at this compared to say high moisture corn and dry corn, you'll certainly see different starch dynamics that's gonna occur out there in the rumen of these animals. Another one was uh, looking at some 10,000 samples. They have corn processing scores. That test is really uh, ramped up here uh, in the last several years. On the left side, you can see uh, below 50. In other words, if you have less than 50% of the corn particles that are going through this 4.75 millimeter screen, uh, that would be considered undesirable. And, and so that's the gray. The blue is 50 to 70. That's basically adequate. And uh, over 70 means uh, that's an excellent job, an optimal job. And Dr. Randy Shaver, Wisconsin, would say you're going to put about two pounds more milk as you go from the gray to the blue and another two pounds from the blue to the green. So there could be four pounds or two liters of milk laying there on the table. You can see not a, a big trend. I was hoping uh, that the data would even be stronger than what it is. A little uh, pretty, looks pretty flat to me, Mike. But look at the distribution, and you can see a much tighter distribution. We got a lot. We get rid, rid of a lot of those low ones down there in the 20s and 30s and 40s. It's a much tighter nesting here at this stage of the game. And you can see once you get up around uh, around 85 to 90, that's probably about as good a job as you're going to get there. And in some cases, that could be shredlage. We can argue that a bit later in the Q and A if we want to. I didn't know if I should leave this one in, but I just thought I'd share it to you. Uh, it, it has more to uh, do more than just corn silage, but they ran uh, a surprisingly big number for me. Almost uh, 1,200 uh, fecal starches were asking, how well are my dairy cows extracting the starch from the total tract? So this includes the... Uh, uh, rumen, the small intestine, and even the large intestine at this point. Wisconsin guidelines are you like to be in the green, and that's about half the samples, which means we're doing a good job. The reason I say you have to be careful with this is because of uh, any starch. This could be starch that's coming from corn grain, high moisture corn, corn silage. How many would enter into this one? Some of the other byproducts as well. In the blue, you can see that there's an opportunity in those in blue, and that's about another 20% of the samples. You know, and now you begin to look at particle size, processing of the corn silage, particle size of the corn grain, uh, steam flake versus ground versus cracked. All those things come in and would we'll play with that game. And what's scary is you can see as you go more to the right, the numbers are still are still there. And Penn, uh, Pennsylvania would suggest that for about every 1% increase as you go to the right, that's about two thirds of a pound of lost milk that's still in the manure. Or for you uh, Europeans, that's gonna be about, uh, you know, about a third of a liter of milk. And so our goal here in uh, Illinois is to steal as much milk as we can from the manure. Well, uh, Mike, we don't get a premium for high starch manure here in, the, in, in Illinois, nor uh, milk urea nitrogen numbers that are high. That means we have more nitrogen coming in the urine as well. 
Let's take a quick look at alfalfa. The numbers are a little bit less, uh, about 14,000 samples tested here. Again, the same format from Dairy Lynn Labs. And again, not a lot of exciting things here, Mike. Uh, so those of you say about the same as last year on legume and grasses, uh, this data would say you're right. A little uh, uptick, always good to see that one point increase in NDF digestibility at 30 hours. And that reflects in a little bit lower UNDF. So not quite as dramatic as the corn silage, but certainly going in the right direction. Uh, ash contents at 11% look a little high. Maybe we have a little bit of dirt in there as well. I come down to RFQ, and, and that's a big number. To me, that is a big number. Uh, I like those numbers. Uh, looking at that, 161. So you can see that basically the average haylage that came into Dairyland Labs are good enough for dairy cows. Good enough for dairy cows all the way. And uh, sometimes those uh, each one of those points are worth 80, 90 cents a dollar. So basically, we have another five or six dollars on value. Uh, laying there on, on the PowerPoint. Again, uh, Dairyland did a nice job. There you can see the uh, uh, spread of that. Uh, what caught my eye, uh, Mike, is the NDFD at 30 hours, the one here down on, on the bottom. Uh, you can see in the green here, two blips. So I don't know if that's uh, first crop and second crop and third crop, or uh, this is uh, Illinois over here doing a good job and Wisconsin doing a poor job. Who knows what that could be, but it is interesting. We we lost the, the characteristic bell-shaped curve. Kind of interesting. Maybe that's uh, politics for all I know. Maybe that's Democrats, Republicans. We move on. Uh, again, uh, our thanks to uh, Rock River Lab. They sent us a nice set of data as well, but more of a national look. So we, so those of you that are online that are, are in, on the East Coast or on the West Coast, you can kind of see, and that you can see they stacked up six years of it. So here's some real studying for you agronomists out there and for you dairy producers. Uh, Jim put in uh, lines, which really helped me out a great deal, the 3040 on, on this PowerPoint here. And so you can see, uh, uh, that actually the Midwest and East, we have actually shifted a little bit more uh, on corn silage to the right side, which means we should have a little bit more starch, a little bit more energy compared to what's going on in the, in, in the as the Rock River deemed as the West area. Here's your NDFs. And again, about the same thing showing, uh, you can see that our NDFs uh, total NDFs a bit lower in, in the Midwest. And actually, if, if my eyes are not deceiving, maybe the East has done even a little better job. And so a little more uh, nutrient, a little bit less nutrient detergent fiber, which should mean we should have a little bit more uh, energy coming from these feed samples as well. They also ran the in vitro starch digestibility at seven hours. And again, you can see uh, kind of a, 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 a bi biphasic uh, modeling here, especially in the West Coast. I'm not going to try to explain that, but again, uh, you, you can see that uh, we're a little better off here in the Midwest and, and uh, East here. Uh, primarily, uh, it could be related to the level of starch and uh, the amount of moisture that it was when it went in to be ensiled as far as that goes. This is a number that you and I as nutritionists are going to watch because uh, it'll do some changing now, uh, as we call a, a Christmas corn silage, which means we start feeding after the holidays, this corn silage, when it's been in storage for at least three or four months, and that should improve these numbers even up a little bit higher. But you can see some of these numbers are already quite high. So Rock River Lab did a nice summary for me, and I will use their summary. They say on the West Coast, that way I can't get in any trouble here. So if you don't blame me if you don't like this summary. On the West Coast, you can see a little bit less energy for 2020. In the Midwest, you can see uh, they're uh, here. And of course, on the East, actually perhaps the winner at, at this point. Uh, maybe maybe uh, their arrows you can see uh, interpreted as well. Forge inventory goes very, very quickly. Uh, Mike, you did some, some nice uh, survey that worked there, but let's kind of listen to see what our our, list, our listeners, our, our attendees have here today. So again, polls are open, Jim has got it open, it's up there and you can now vote. And so we uh, want you watch, watching the vote coming in much like we did with, with Pennsylvania. Now, but we're watching uh, forage inventory. You have four, uh, five choices. I will have excess forage this year. I will be selling forage this year. I have the right amount this year. I may be short this year and I really don't know. Mike, if my memory is correct, we had about 24% in that fourth category based on your survey of people that you were surveying there as well. And so I'm looking to see and looks like we got again about 60% of the vote in. And so Jim, uh, let's go ahead and show it. I know, Abby, we're cutting you out here today, but uh, 
Uh, we're getting going to be tight on time, and so we'll just keep trucking along. So you can see uh, here, uh, very, very similar, surprising uh, uh, to me at least, Mike, uh, that uh, it shakes out pretty much the way uh, you, you predicted it would at this stage of the game. So pretty similar type numbers here. And uh, the one that scares me is the one on the bottom. 8% don't know. Now, let me tell you, unless you are living in Puerto Rico or, or South America, I think your cropping year is just about over, even though it's going to be 74 degrees here today in Illinois, a record temperature at this point, and we'll move on. So we're going to go ahead and uh, click on my PowerPoint and move forward. So first of all, the question is, you just got to do this. If you're a dairy farmer, and you haven't done this, then wake up. Do it now. You got to do an inventory now. Uh, here's my example. I got a 1,400 pound Holstein cow, nice thumbnail, 2% of body weights. This applies to dry cows and milk cows. Yes, different forage combinations, probably. Then we're going to say, well, how many days do you have to feed this? Uh, if you're going to a first crop uh, uh, legume grass, for some of you, uh, this is going to be maybe 180, 200 days, a lot, a lot shorter. So I multiply that out. That means I need a slightly more than five tons of dry matter per cow per year. That includes my milk cows, my dry cows, pretty easy to figure. And Jim did some neat things here and says, what, we, we always have some loss. And you could argue I was being kind to you at 6% loss. I think corn silage, that's a good number. But I think uh, if you if you can get this number that low with hay and haylage, good luck. Good luck there. That means I got to have now five and a five and a half tons of dry matter per cow per year. And a lot of you are still having replacement values, replacement heifers, I should say, on your farm. Add thirty percent to this number here. If some of you are culling back on heifers because of of uh, beef breeding, that could change. Or better off, use your value. If you have a value on your heifer rations that you're feeding right now, now the math becomes very easy. Why do you have to do it now? Because you and I are going to look at forage extenders. This could be byproduct feeds. That could be like soy hulls or citrus pulp or beet pulp or some ex forage extenders, which we'll talk about here in just a second. Okay, let's look at the other feedstuffs we have. A uh, corn. Uh, Mike said I'm going to cover it, and I am. Uh, a good year on corn, 14.72 uh, million metric tons in the United States. That number was shaved back uh, from September to October because of the dry conditions in Iowa and Illinois and part of the other corn belts as well. So we lost a little bit of corn there. And uh, the big question is, there's China again, and you can see some of the numbers that was reported by an economist here. That doesn't add up to 2,700, 20 27 hundred uh, 27 metric a million metric ton uh, that means china is going to buy it from somewheres at this point and i didn't realize ukraine was such a big player uh, we now look at average yields and you can see uh, jim did some nice animation here uh the the national average 200 uh, 178 bushels per acre illinois 200 bushels per acre so we win that one again iowa take that and the price right now four dollars a bushel uh, we've seen that at 410 411 so it keeps bouncing around a little bit i believe that is the december futures market that jim is listed up there for us. So that one's a bit fluid. Remember when uh, what Mike said about uh, the dairy marginal program, this will have impact, which means that you're going to have a, a bit of a break coming here uh, in terms of what that spread's going to be. What about our soybeans? Again, a big year on soybeans, uh, uh, 4.3 million bushels of beans. Price, uh, 1048. I saw some 1060 on the board in the last couple of weeks. So that one is jumping around. And of course, there's factors listed. You can see China is buying lots of soybeans right now. Uh, weather uh, is not favorable right now in Brazil and Argentina, major export countries. And what about COVID-19? Will countries be able to afford to buy our soybeans at those prices uh, for to, to feed their people and their livestock? Again, Jim did a nice job here, and you can see kind of what our average was, fifty, roughly 52 bushels per acre. Illinois wins that one again this year, 60 bushels per acre. The drought did not really change those numbers from USDA as far as that goes. Uh, soybean meal tends to track right along with that, uh, with the uh, soy prices here. Uh, price I've got is 360. I just saw some uh, that just came in over the weekend, uh, 375. Uh, 375. Uh, had you been smart enough in June and July, you could have got this a hundred dollars a ton cheaper if you booked it in there. So watch the markets, make your decisions if you're going to have to buy soybean meal or some other alternative protein source. Let's look at some of these other feed prices here. 
Uh, these are three programs. You all heard about them before uh, from Wisconsin, Feedvale uh, 6.0. There you can pick the nutrients you want to consider. Sesame with the Ohio State University there, and of course, shadow pricing as well. Uh, uh, the one from the Ohio State locks you into those nutrients. If you're interested to print off this table, you can see what they are. So I uh, have a source that sends me these every two weeks. This is Sesame, November, actually uh, November 1st. Uh, another one came in here uh, uh, just two days ago, but you can see uh, the prices we have listed here. If you're in the green, they are very good prices. And so this makes the alfalfa guys uncomfortable, but you can see high quality alfalfa is in the red. Uh, it's a much better buy this year than other years, but still a little bit in the red here. You can see canola is in the red. Uh, heat treated soybean meal is in the green because I am using uh, Sesame's version valuing the bypass or the, the, buy, the RUP value of uh, lysine and the finance. So it really looks looks pretty good at this point. Soybean meal is, is a wash and not much change there. Here comes your byproduct feeds. And again, time is tight. We're not gonna walk you through these, but again, in the green, you can see some really good buys. Uh, listed there to let your eyes uh, go down and whichever one you want to feature. Uh, the spread between uh, current price and break even on corn gluten feed and distillers is really tightened up. It used to be a really super good deal and that's because some of these uh, plants are now shut down because of uh, oil prices, fracking and, and, and politics to be rather honest about it. And of course, uh, you can uh, look at your favorite feeds there. The one that catches my eye is hominy. Hominy is uh, really well priced and that can be kind of a corn stretcher as far as that goes. Fuzzy cotton seeds, really a good price here. I If I was gonna milk cows and I'm gonna feed fuzzy cotton seed, I'm gonna lock her in. Uh, the word is usually October, November has the lowest cotton seed prices. Mike reflected that same thing on hay prices uh, at different times of the year. Uh, there, there's something laying on the table right now, fuzzy cottonseed, and uh, I'm not sure about soy and corn prices right now. We got questions here, so let's wrap up with these questions quickly that come in. Uh, we can't do much about some of these at this point. What about that drought, drought stress corn silage? Uh, the key is it could be all over the map. Remember Mike said that he's in uh, western Nebraska, some of that was basically dried out grass. So it depends how much starch you have. And we know the government did reduce the starch levels in our, our corn yields. And therefore our corn side just probably suffered from that just a little bit as well. If some of that uh, uh, really drought stressed early corn was grass-like, that NDF digestibility could be higher. Uh, that's the good news. What's the bad news? There probably isn't much starch there at this point. So that ratio of corn grain to uh, corn plant dry, uh, dry matter becomes another factor. Nitrate shouldn't be a problem through going through a silage fermentation here. Uh, we heard some people say, can I cut it 10 inches higher? Sure you can, but remember now you're gonna leave probably a ton of dry matter out there as well. My recommendation is uh, chop it and uh, monitor it. And uh, if you're gonna buy it or sell it for somebody that need to buy, there's an alternative feed stuff for you. Cornell suggests that price will be about 65 to 85% of normal corn silage. You would back into that based on the starch analyses in the NDF and NDF digestibility values of that feed stuff as well. And ideally, if you could have stored that in a bag or a different bunker, gives you some flexibility as you start blending these different feedstuffs there. This one may be true, Mike. Uh, we are still hearing people taking sixth crop uh, here in Illinois, uh, big year here. And some of that is going to be made, most of that's going to be silage. You usually can't get it dry unless you're going to cut it this week when we got 50, uh, 71 degrees and 10, 10, uh, 10 and 15 mile an hour winds. But that feed may not ferment. And so the take home message here is feed it up. Well, you are not making wine out there, you're making forage and it doesn't get better with age. And so uh, if you've got some of that uh, non-fermented feed, feed it up right now. What about cover crops? Well, the question is a big, big push. And I think we really got to look at getting more and more of our soil protected here. Are you going to harvest that in the spring as a winter triticale or winter wheat? Uh, then you have to watch your maturities. Uh, some neat stuff out of Illinois showing that you can actually improve uh, uh, the, 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 the nitrogen loss from lands, but with the winter crop and they're saying cutting it at or, or, or stopping it at six or eight inches and not much of a yield reduction, especially with soybeans. So that's another choice you have if you're not going to harvest it at this point. And uh, certainly we are highly recommending a cover crop. Uh, this question you can read quickly. This is high chopped corn silage. 
You can read the, the guidelines here. Uh, if you use MELC 2006 equations, it's a wash. In other words, when you pick up the quality with high chop, you leave extra tonnage in the field. And this comes from the Wisconsin uh, Extension Specialist there. He said, well, you'll leave about a ton of dry matter for every 10 inches you leave out there in the field. Uh, I see no advantage of doing that with BMR, but there are some people high chopping BMR, leave more of that stock out there. I recommend chopping it conventionally and going ahead and make the adjustments in the ration using my other feed ingredients. Uh, Forge extenders as we wrap up here, and we're just about running out of time here quickly. Uh, I, I think you really got to look at this. Uh, forage extenders can, can be used to, to limit a dry matter intake in certain uh, uh, groups of cattle, especially you'll see that in just a minute. It's another way to control body condition and weight gain in some of our tail end cows. In some cases, it can be a real plus. It can slow the rate of passage, which improves feed efficiency and digestibility. And in some cases, it's a source of effective fiber, especially in these higher corn silage based diets. What do we mean by forage extenders? We're looking at straws, corn stalks, uh, low quality legume grass forages. I'm using an RFQ below 100. That makes it pretty straw like. And of course, corn cobs. And if you're down in some parts of South America, uh, sugar gain bagasse would be another choice as well. Our guidelines on forage extenders are listed there. Uh, limit because it can really slow down and reduce dry matter intake. So I'm saying a half to up to two pounds a day. Going higher than that, I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to lose dry matter intake. My dry cows, that's Dr. Jim Drakeley's uh, low uh, Goldilocks diets there. And Pat Huffman's guidelines on heifers, older heifers, especially over 12 months. If you've got these high quality alfalfas, grasses, and legumes, uh, the forages are basically too good for these heifers. They can just eat too much. And you can see some heifers there on the right. Uh, I'm a little nervous about the particle size. I think they could sort the daylights out of it. But you can see there is some filler over there as well. Mike, you already discussed the, the cocktail forage blends. Uh, lots of different ways to position these. You've covered this very, very nicely at this point. Some of these grasses like warm weather. The other good news, I like the cocktail blends, especially the sorghums and then grasses. What a great place for manure in the summer and to harvest our feed. And then finally, John uh, uh, Gazer uh, had some information on cross contaminations. That's always a concern about clean feed. That especially applies uh, to uh, feeds that have floods, soil contamination, manure contamination out there as well. So be aware of that. These are the bacteria and they can really cause us some problems as well. So there's our take home strategies, uh, Mike and, and uh, attendees. I think you can read them quicker than I can talk them, although I can maybe challenge you that on a little bit. And with that, we'll turn the program back to Abby to uh, wrap it up. Thank you very much. And Mike and Mike, our two presenters today, I'd like to thank you both for sharing your information here. Um, the two of you are very knowledgeable on this topic, and then we appreciate the extra time you put into getting some current data and recommendations for all of our listeners. So thank you very much for that. Um, once again, I want to thank Kuhn for sponsoring today's program. We certainly appreciate their support of our programming. If you have any questions for our speakers, I want to remind you that you can type them into the questions section right now. We have a few that have come in, and um, we would welcome a few more questions if you have them. So type them in at this time. And also, if you want these slides, um, since you are a live attendee, you can print them off. Go down to the handout section and click on that PDF and print a copy for yourself. If you would like to view this webinar again, it will be available online on our archive later this week. Um, you can find it at our website, hordes.com slash webinars. Um, also at that page are all of our past webinars, which have been archived for the last 10 years since we started this webinar series. So um, please check those out if you want to. If you can go to the next slide, please. Um, these are some of our upcoming webinars, and we'd ask if you mark your calendar if you're interested in these topics. In December, we will have Bill Weiss from The Ohio State University, and he will be giving a presentation titled Improved Methods for Comparing the Economic Value of Feed. Um, and you can use that in your decision making when putting together rations. So that presentation will take place on December 14th, 2020. And then starting off 2021 on January 11th, we have a Dairy Situation and Outlook presentation, and that will come from Mark Stevenson from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. So um, please go ahead and mark your calendar for those upcoming webinars. Now, Mike, um, we have a few questions here. Do you want 
to handle those or do you want sure to we can handle those uh mike rankin i think this is one for you and the question is uh, it, it, uh pennsylvania usually is much higher and i assume this is on feed prices that we had on the graph there than other states uh, you want to explain why, why pennsylvania is higher in feed prices uh any comments on that yeah relative to hay prices uh you'll always see uh those reported usda prices higher uh, and the reason is that they those prices come from uh, a couple of uh, southeast Pennsylvania uh, hay auctions um, and um, uh, a large, uh, you know, we're talking Lancaster County, uh, that area, um, a large Amish population, uh, but also a fairly large population where um, some of those, uh, a lot of small square bales still being used there. Uh, so it's an auction situation. Uh, a lot of smaller, uh, farms in some cases, I mean, there's all sizes. Uh, but I think just the fact that, um, they really reflect more so the, uh, small square bale premium, uh, and and just the competitive hay auction nature of those Pennsylvania prices. Okay, here I got a question that just came in here. Said about feeding corn stalks. To have any recommendations? You you bet. You, I, I do have them. Uh, the first recommendation: be well aware. Depending how you harvest these corn stalks, we know the husks, for example, extremely high quality, where the stalks is pretty plain Jane type feed. So the question is: Are you picking this up? Uh, you know, with, with a flail type chopper or device, or, or what are you actually getting there? Then we're saying I would like to see them chopped almost like corn silage. Now that's tough to do. I understand, but that really Really cuts down on the sorting because I've been on farms and these heifers are not dumb. They know exactly corn stalks are not very tasty, but the uh, corn stalks and leaves are right on the money. So I think processing that and Pat Hoffman's number is pretty good. Uh, in other words, he basically uses uh, the, the corn silage and legume grass forages as their base feed and the corn stalks just become fill factors, to be very honest, not contributing an awful lot of nutrients. Typically in that to 20% range, the older the heifer, the more the corn stalks. I would not do it under 12 months months of age, those heifers are still rapidly growing and they don't have quite the capacity there to consume like, like a dairy cow. We'll move on to another question that Mike will let you have first crack at it. Uh, it says that uh, we have, uh, we come up with layers of unfermented corn silage in a bunker silage, which smells good without any obvious signs of mold. Oh, you have any, what's your thinking uh, observations on this? Uh, did it not undergo fermentation and can I feed it? Well, I mean, there's a couple of reasons. I mean, one depends on uh, if it was last year and it was a late harvest, then, you know, fairly late in the season. If it goes in at a certain temperature, it's going to stay at that temperature and it's not going to ferment. Um, if in, in that case, uh, you know, we, we typically recommend to get it fed out before the next spring, before temperatures start to warm up again, um, just because at that point uh, uh, it could start to heat. I don't know, you probably have some comments on that too, Mike. Sure, Mike, I can add one more thing. I uh, appreciate your comments, I agree with you 100%. Uh, there are some products that you can actually put on the top of the, the last foot of those corn silage bunkers. You know, uh, dry products you can sprinkle in that retards any fermentation losses there. Uh, I, I think the question is, it's a great question, if that is black or gunky, I will not feed that uh, material. There's better words for it, but we'll stay material with that. I would throw it off. I would not feed that to my cows at this stage of the game. If that material is really dry, dry and may have a little bit of mold in it uh most guys will feed right through it so i, I don't think we have a, a yeah. problem did there he so. say it? did he say it was in the top just in the top of the bunker yep yep oh, yep. Okay. no one that's I right you're saying part. layers you're, you're uh, yeah. Mike, good good catch yeah usually it's the top layer is where we're, we're looking at yeah right i i was assuming he was having like layers within the face of his bunker yeah, Mike, I, you and I both seen it where you'll see layers and bunkers. Usually that means that we had equipment breakdown or we got a couple inches of rain and we had to take a break in the harvesting window and we just couldn't keep going as far as that goes. So uh, 
Uh, again, there's nothing much you can do. At that point, you're going to feed through it if it's layered. But if it's on top, then you do have some opportunities. Yeah, there's lots of options if it's on top. And yeah, and our, a person came in and said middle of the silo. So an individual just came back in middle of the silo. So uh, um, it, 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 as I said, we heard this before. It is what it is. And so I think I think you're going to feed feed through it. So I think we're done, Abby. We're going to turn the program back to you to wrap her up. We got all the questions answered. Thanks so much. Very good. Um, once again, thank you to Mike Rankin and Mike Hutchins for their presentation today. Hopefully everyone has a little bit of a better understanding on the current situation out there after harvest and what's in the feed inventories for 2021. Um, once again, please um, look ahead to our future webinars and consider joining us for another presentation. December 14th, we have Bill Weiss presenting on the economic value of feedstuffs, and that presentation is sponsored by QLF. Then in January, we have a Dairy Situation and Outlook for 2021, presented by Mark Stevenson from the University of Wisconsin, Illinois. And um, I want to, one more time, show Kuhn their, our appreciation for their support of our program. We thank you for sponsoring this month's webinar. And um, also importantly, I want to thank all of you out in the audience for joining us today. Um, it's our goal to provide you with topics and presentations that can help you run your dairy farms or um, that are a benefit to the farms that you work with. So we appreciate you taking time to join us today. Until next time, um, I want to say goodbye from all of us here at Horde Steerman and the University of Illinois. Hope you all stay safe and well, and we'll look forward to seeing you on a future webinar.